Aloha. Uh, this is Franny Brewer and Jade Miyashiro of the Big Island Invasive Species Committee. Happy Earth Day. Um, and we're here to talk to you about invasive species in Hawaii. So thank you very much for joining us. And we're going to get right into it this morning because we know uh, everybody's on a class schedule and probably has some time limitations. Um, but yeah, Big Island Invasive Species Committee, and we obviously, as our name implies, we specialize in invasive species. And so when we're talking about invasive species, we like to really think about the history and what those terms and those words mean. So today we're gonna talk about something, you kind of hear those terms thrown around, native, invasive. So we're gonna really talk about what the difference between native, introduced, and invasive species are, and how the process of humans coming to the islands really push that process of invasion um, through because it's really a human caused phenomena. So we'll talk about some of the mistakes that we as humans made in the past, um, trying to fix the problem that we had caused, but then sort of what we're facing today with invasive species. Okay, and you can type your questions into the chat box at any time. And Jade's going to be monitoring the chat box so she can pause and, at, and have me uh, answer any questions that you have. Okay, so first, native species. So what is a native species? We hear that term used a lot, uh, especially when we're talking about um, threatened and endangered animals, we're talking about native forests. So what actually is the definition of a native species? Well, in order to de define a species, you really have to look at place, right? So we start with that sense of place. Hawaii is the most distant chain of islands or archipelago in the world. We're over 2,500 miles away from these continental systems where uh, life really came up. And as we know very well here on the Big Island, we are volcanic islands, which means that the islands were formed by lava coming from a hot spot, rising up and creating land. So there wasn't any life sort of living on top of that hot lava um, when these islands first broke through millions of years ago. So how does life get here? Well, we know the three W's, things have to cross that 2000 plus miles uh, of ocean. So you have your wind, wings, or waves, or in Hawaiian, the three M's, Makani, Manu, Moana. And anything that got to Hawaii had to cross that ocean somehow. And so it's a really huge barrier, really unusual. But things could be blown on the wind. We have these big storm systems and just a little bit of seeds or a small animal like a, uh, the ancestor of the happy face spider could just blow across the ocean. And um, we have manu, which are the things that actually flew here, the birds, right, on their manu, their wings. And the birds could have things stuck to their bodies or they could be carrying things in their tummy, right? Anything that the bird was carrying across the ocean with it brings to the island uh, and contributes that to the biota here. And then you have things that just float on the waves or float on, you know, maybe a, an old log or something that's, that's in the water and, and make it to the shores. So those are the only ways that prior to humans being here that organisms could actually arrive in the islands. And this was such a difficult thing to do. And then once you got here, you're in a new environment that's completely different from the one that you left. So you have to figure out how do you survive? How do you find a habitat? How do you get the things you need, water and food? And uh, how do you figure out how to live in this new place? That's a challenge. So maybe things got all the way here 2000 miles, but then <laughs> Maki died dead. Um, then even if you make it and you figure all that out and you live a great life, are you able to reproduce? Are you able to make babies that will continue your species in this new place? That, those are three big barriers. And so only once about every 10,000 years on average, did a species actually get here and survive and then have offspring. So really, really unusual and rare event. And what happens is that once those things start having babies, the babies start to change, right? That's evolution. They start changing in this new environment to fit in and, and to sort of uh, get those resources a little bit better than the things that came before. And so that's adaptation. Slowly over time, those generations are adapting to this new land. And then they become new species that eventually after, you know, 
10,000 years, 50,000 years, a few hundred thousand years, they look really different than those original ancestors that landed on the islands. Um, one of the coolest things about Hawaii is that example of what we call adaptive radiation. And that's this idea that one ancestor, so if you look in the middle of this picture, there's that one sort of mystery bird. We're not exactly sure what it looked like. We believe it came from Asia. That landed here a few million years ago. And as its baby spread out across the island and they went into new places with different trees, more dry, more wet, more shady, yellow flowers, red flowers, they started to change. So they changed in color, they changed in beak. Some of them were using more bugs for food and some of them were using more nectar for food and some of them were using seeds for food. And so we had this amazing example of adaptive radiation where this one ancestor species, just a few probably straggly birds blown by a storm that made it land in Hawaii, their offspring spread out, took over the whole island, and created 52 new species, which is an amazing example of evolution. And same thing happened with insects. Scientists estimate there was only about 450 times that any insect species arrived in Hawaii in the past. And out of that 450 times, in, in, in millions of years, 450 times, 5,000 new species of insects developed from that. And we have some really unusual and special insects here in Hawaii, like the vaqueo bug, which lives at the top of Mauna Kea, and it feeds on the bodies of dead bugs that blow up the mountain. We have over 940 species of Lepidopterans. Lepidopteran is just a fancy word for moth or butterfly. And the funny thing is that out of almost a thousand Lepidopterans, only two are butterflies. The rest are all moths. And if you think about Hawaii being a place where there were like at least 50 plus new bird species in the world, maybe it's a little safer to be a moth that's out at night than a butterfly that's out at day. Um, but we have all kinds, we have picture wing flies, the yellow faced bee, all kinds of wonderful insects that are found nowhere else in the world. So what changes? Well, we start having people come. So around 1500 years ago, the first humans arrived in Hawaii and they brought with them, as we do when we go places, we like to take our favorite snacks. We like to take our, our stuff that we depend on. And so the first humans, of course, brought their things with them and food and, and whatever they needed. Um, and when they came in, you know, they're coming to this place where all of the plants and the birds and the insects had kind of uh, learned to be evolved with each other. So it was a, a system that was very closed. Um, and when you bring new things into that system, you start to make changes to it and not all of those changes are good. So after the humans arrived, first thing, uh, we have the humans bring things like kalo or ulu, right? Things that we needed for food and that was fine, right? That's what the humans needed for food. We don't tend to see Kahlo taking over the coastline. We don't tend to see Ulu growing into the forest and replacing all the other trees. They're not considered invasive species because they're just, they need to be cultivated. They need to be taken care of. Those are our human brought species. So we call them introduced. All that introduced means is that it had to come here on a boat or in modern times, also possibly on a plane. So all introduced species are is something that humans brought. And it doesn't mean good or bad, it just means that's how it got here. Now, what can happen is that some of those introduced species and around the world, the percent is about 10% 10, 10 of things that we move from one place to another actually do end up causing some kind of harm. So about 10% of our species will cause a little harm, about 1% cause a lot of harm, but somewhere in that scale, um, when you're causing harm, you're, you end up being called an invasive species um, because you're hurting the things that are already there. Invasive species have a very specific definition, right? They cause harm to the environment, to the economy or human health. So they're introduced and then that's the second part is that they're doing something bad. This could look like a lot of things. And biologically, we see things like rats, which prey on or outcompete species, right? They might use the food better. Um, you know, they, they make more babies. They, they might be a plant that makes millions of seeds. Um, so it, it gets in the ground and it sprouts before the, 
um, native plants can sprout and so it starts to really take over and that starts to change the landscape and make it unhealthy and unfriendly to the species that were living there before. Um, one of the first examples the first humans brought in uh, was the, the mice and the rats, right? Which could have been brought intentionally or they could have just been stowaways on the boats. Rats are notorious around the world for stowing away on boats and ships. So one of the first things that we have here is our first uh, mammalian predator. So prior to this, there's only one mammal that's native to Hawaii and that's the Hawaiian bat. Um, there was no kind of ground mammal and there's nothing that is, um, kind of a predator. And so these guys came and found a bird paradise full of nests and baby birds inside the nests and you start to see predation from uh, rodents immediately. A little later on, right, so we have a little bit of, of impact happening, we get to uh, the western arrival in, um, in Hawaii. So in the late 1700s, the big money movement uh, across the world was whaling. So whaling was how you made your money. Now, you know, oil and gas, everything runs on oil and gas. We make plastics out of petroleum. We, we all of our cars, all of our factories, everything's running on oil and gas. But back then, we didn't have oil and gas yet. So the, the way that the world ran was on whale oil as well as far as catch a whale, you can make a ton of money off of one whale. So you saw people, the whales were used for meat, can the meat, the whale bone itself, because we didn't have plastics then, it's, it was used in a lot of things that today we use plastics for, and especially the oils. The oils were used for lamp lighting, the oils were used for just any kind of lubrication to make uh, you know, machinery work. So it was big money. And that brought a lot of people into the Pacific and it brought a lot of Westerners into Hawaii. Now, unfortunately, this was not good news for our birds. So how are the whales connected to those forest birds? Well, let's look at it. You have the whaling ships coming to Hawaii from very, very distant lands. And unfortunately, um, instead of distilling the water, which is how the original Polynesian settlers and the folks you know, would, who traveled the Pacific Ocean would, would do with, uh, to get fresh water while on the voyage, the fresh water was actually packed and stored in these very large whaling ships. Well, what lays its eggs in fresh water? We end up getting mosquitoes. At the same time, we have pigs, which were brought by originally by uh, the first settlers to Hawaii, and they were very much part of uh, Hawaiian culture at that time. However, what wasn't part of the culture was guns. So there weren't metals here in Hawaii. They used ads, things like that. When they wanted a pig, they weren't really interested in going out into the forest and chasing it. They wanted it to, to be fat and right next to the house where they could access it easily and have a nice luau and nice fat pig. Um, but with the arrival of Westerners, it was also brought in the concept of hunting and using guns, um, letting the pigs out into the forest. And in fact, the Westerners brought their own pigs uh, that mixed with the Polynesian pigs, and these pigs were released into the forest. Well, how do pigs and mosquitoes connect? That seems a little weird. Well, you've seen the damage that pigs do to the ground, right? They like to rut everything up and make these great big muddy piles. That's unusual in Hawaiian forests. There were no animals that would have done that prior to the arrival of, of uh, humans. Um, and unfortunately that creates puddles, which are habitat for mosquitoes. Mosquitoes can lay their eggs in that puddles, uh, in those puddles. And then next thing you know, the mosquitoes attack those forest birds. And the birds that were here had no defenses against diseases that were carried by those uh, mosquitoes. And they succumbed to avian pox and avian malaria to the extent that most of those birds are gone already. So of those 52 species that it descended from that first bird that arrived here, um, only 18 of those species are still alive. And, and that, that's within just the last couple hundred years that we've lost those birds. Um, six of the birds are considered critically endangered, which means that they could go extinct in our lifetime, sometime in the next 10 or 20 years, we could see the disappearance of these birds. And this is just the little forest birds. There are many other Hawaiian birds like the nene or the alala that aren't considered in here because they're not honey creepers. They came from different ancestral lines. Um, and they have also uh, struggled with being threatened and endangered. The alala right now is only in captivity. These kinds of things are what our birds are facing. Um, 
Hawaii, unfortunately, is currently known as the extinction capital of the United States because of these losses. The o'o, the mamo, um, beautiful birds that used to fill our forests, which we will never hear their songs again. So kind of heartbreaking to see that happen. Um, inadvertently, people bring things in and, and have these impacts. So one of the other things, you know, pigs are ungulates and all of their ungulate cousins also devastating to Hawaii's ecosystem. So things like goats, cows, sheep, all of those things when they are allowed to go loose on a landscape can be devastating. They produce a lot of offspring, right? Remember that's a, that's a feature of invasive species, things that produce lots of offspring and, and reproduce really quickly. Um, and unfortunately those herds can become very big. Um, when you see that kind of large herd, they got to eat a lot of vegetation. And the Hawaiian plants were the most delicious vegetation they could, they could get their tongues wrapped around. So as Hawaii was bringing in more and more unglets, and we started to see the development of ranching, so lots of sheep, lots of cows, um, they were eating the ground down to where the vegetation was gone. And that led to erosion. So this is an image from Koholawe, even today in modern times, you can see this kind of red cloud out there that's going off the cliff. That's just dirt still being blown away um, by the, the wind. Koholawe was used for many years before it was bombed. It had already been ecologically devastated by uh, sheep and goats that had been uh, ranched on the island. So unfortunately, it's still losing to this day. Uh, it's still losing a lot of uh, the, the topsoil. And you can see that red color. This is not a healthy uh, ecosystem here. Nothing can grow there because it's lost all the nutrient level that's in the soil. Then you see this sort of Malka to Makai um, impact where when you have rain and you have erosion, you have runoff, and this is on all of our islands, you'll get those big brown kind of clouds out into the near shore environment. Well, those impact our fisheries. Our coral reefs along our coastlines are really important for, for baby fishes. And this is somewhere that our fish populations depend on these areas in order to maintain themselves. So when you get this erosion and you get this kind of covering the coral, impacting the coral, impacting the reef area, this will also affect our fisheries. So you can really see how what's happening on the land can have a connection with what's happening in the sea. So erosion was scary even back in the late 1800s when farmers and ranchers and everybody started noticing like, whoa, like, we brought in all the cows, we brought in all the goats, and they ate everything, no vegetation, there's no root system to hold on to the soil, we're losing the soil. And especially the farmers were sort of looking at the ranchers that were up on the land and said, hey, you know, you're taking all the soil. So at the time, uh, folks tried to fix it, you know, really well-meaning, like, wow, we gotta find some plants that can grow very, very fast, and that, that can just hold on to this soil, you know, that can grow even in tough areas. So they went around the world and they found a bunch of different plants like Albizia, right? And so it became very important to get as many plants that they could find that were the fastest growing, that reproduced really fast, that grew really fast, and get them in the ground just to hold on to the soil, which, you know, that's a well-meaning plan. I mean, they, they were trying really hard to do it correctly, but unfortunately, a lot of these plants in Hawaii, it's not a good combination. So something like Albizia, which was planted by the thousands in forest reserves across Hawaii in an attempt to uh, save uh, the Hawaiian forest, it actually takes over and replaces the Hawaiian forest. And it's also a dangerous tree for people. This tree grows so fast that nowhere else in the world does a tree grow faster than Albizia does in Hawaii. Not even in the Moluccan Islands where Albizia comes from does it grow as fast as it does here because it doesn't have any of its natural predators, little bugs and, and things that usually keep the growth slower. So here it goes about 15 to 20 feet in its first year, which after that can still continue to grow an inch per day to over 200 feet, which can happen in just a, a few decades. And this guy was uh, planted, like I said, by the thousands in the, in the 20s and 30s. And you can kind of see we have records that show. And this was work that people were proud of doing. They thought they were doing a good thing. But unfortunately, now that we have seen Albizia 
uh, spread on its own outside of the places where it was planted very, very aggressively. Um, it's very unsafe because it grows so fast. The wood is very weak and it topples over. So it's very expensive for things like um, the electric company or the Department of Transportation to have to pull these trees out of the road all the time. And um, besides the money, it's just dangerous. You can't really be under uh, an Albizia tree on a rainy or windy day because there's a really good chance those limbs can just come crashing down. And they have killed and injured people uh, throughout the world and even here in Hawaii. So um, not a good tree to have around you. Um, it's also just taken over. So you can see in this photo from the 60s, way in the back above Rainbow Falls in Hilo, you see the outline of Mauna Kea. You could actually see Mauna Kea from Rainbow Falls. Why can't you see it today? Because it's completely blocked by these trees that uh, have spread well outside where they were planted and they're now completely blocking that view. So we go down and we look at, at Rainbow Falls and we think, oh, you know, that's beautiful. But unfortunately, none of that vegetation should be there. None of that vegetation there is uh, actually native. So the view we're looking at is not the view that the Hawaiians of 200 years ago would have been looking at. Okay, so again, remembering that biologically invasive species have a definition because they have certain qualities. So they prey on or outcompete native species for resources. They quickly mature and reproduce. They aggressively take over new areas and they transform landscapes. So just because it's introduced does not mean that it's going to do these things. Only a certain subset of introduced organisms will actually do something like this. So we've learned all these lessons, right? So we're doing something different today, right? Uh, unfortunately, in the modern era, we're getting more invasive species than ever. So in the 1990s, recognizing that invasive species were a problem across the United States, and actually they're a problem throughout the world, um, the president at the time established in federal law that invasive species had a definition. And the definition was it's a non-native species. So it has to be something that was brought from someplace else, either accidentally or on purpose. And it affects bad in a negative way. It affects the environment, the economy, or human health. And in 2000, in the early 2000s, Hawaii adopted the same definition and they added way of life to reflect that Hawaii has unique cultural and lifestyle aspects uh, that make it um, something that we should consider when we think about the impact of invasive species. So one of the worst invasive species are fruit flies. Um, you don't think about them a lot. They're just kind of annoying, but fruit flies affect the economy. So we've talked a lot about things affecting the native forests and the native plants and native animals. Um, fruit flies actually hurt a lot of our other introduced species, the introduced species that we want to take care of, the things that we need for food. Um, and that makes you an invasive species as well, as well. It's not just harming natives. It's also harming the things that humans need. So these fruit flies, which have been brought in from the late 1800s until the 1990s, accidentally, um, no one brought them in on purpose. These fruit flies uh, sting over 800 species of fruits and vegetables, which causes a lot of loss to farmers. And in fact, one of the original canoe plants that the, uh, the Hawaiian settlers or the Polynesian settlers brought with them became a very important part of Hawaiian culture, the uh, ipu, um, the gourds, right? This plant used to, they used to make beautiful gourds used for everything. They're used for religious ceremonies. They're used for, um, drums, music. They're also used just for household things, carrying water, storing food, right? Um, really, really important plant in Hawaiian culture. Unfortunately, these days, most of the ipu that are used in Hawaii or are made uh, into these beautiful instruments, they come from California. This is a, an ipu growing operation in California. And the reason why is those fruit flies attack those gourd plants so aggressively that the gourds can't grow past a very small amount without the farmer being out there every single day trying to, to chase them off. So we have sort of that loss uh, of something that, that would have been a wonderful thing to have here and we don't have access to it anymore because of invasive species. So what are we doing? 
Well, in Hawaii, unfortunately, about one new insect species arrives every day. Obviously, those are accidental. They're coming in in cargo. They're coming in in potted plants. And that's just insects. So we went from once every 10,000 years to about once every 25 years when, when the first humans got here, some, they brought something new, to now we're bringing in just insects, one a day. Um, not all of those are going to survive, but of the ones that survive and, and are able to have offspring, we think there's about 17 a year that are actually uh, having offspring and are becoming uh, naturalized to Hawaii, where they're, pro they're uh, propagating on their own. Um, are they invasive? I mean, they're introduced. Are they invasive? Will they cause harm? Well, we generally don't know until they start causing harm and then they get on our radar. So things like larger mammals um, make headlines. So when there's a larger animal that gets, that gets found at the docks or something, you'll usually see that in the paper. Um, sometimes it's something like lizards or snakes. Most of the lizards and snakes that have been caught in Hawaii in the last five years are ones that have been in the pet trade. They, were, they didn't get here by accident, by sneaking into a container. They got here because someone brought them here on purpose ship them in the mail or smuggle them in. So we have people still bringing things in intentionally that could be very, very harmful for the Hawaiian environment. Um, sometimes it's an accident, like a, a spider on a, a bunch of uh, fruit. Um, and certainly one of the things that we really try to push is, is trying not to purchase things, especially live plants that are coming from the mainland. Um, Christmas trees have been a long time source of many um, insect invaders. So things like yellow jackets, um, tree frogs, all kinds of stuff have been found in Christmas trees. So not a great um, way to, to avoid getting things into Hawaii. Um, in around the mid 90s, we know there was a shipment of palm trees, palm trees from Florida. So there was a nursery here in Puna that brought in a bunch of palm trees from Florida rather than ones that were grown here and those palm trees had little fire ants in them. And that has led to uh, an absolutely terrible invasive species on the big island predicted to cost about a billion dollars cumulative in this decade um, to uh, farmers, to businesses, to homeowners, to everybody trying to fight fire ants, right? And you just see this kind of really terrible impact uh, when they sting, they sting pets in the eyes and cause them to go blind. Um, so we have lots of issues with little fire ants. Um, also sometime in the 90s, the semi-slug came in, again, probably on plants or maybe even just slug eggs on the underside of one little leaf that was in a big shipment of plants that came in and little, you know, people just went to Walmart and it's five bucks for a house plant, right? Unfortunately, as we're bringing these things in, there could be things like slug eggs uh, just quietly hiding in there. Um, and in this case, you see uh, the semi-slug is associated with carrying a parasite called the rat lungworm parasite. And this is Angiostrongylus cantonensis. Now this parasite was here, at least we know back in the 1950s, 1960s. We know rat lungworm was already in Hawaii many decades ago. And there were other slugs and snails that were in Hawaii. But for some reason, in the early 2000s, when the semi-slug arrived, we saw this huge increase in severe disease. So Rat lungworm disease was here for many decades, but very few people got sick. And then with the semi slug, it's just a really, really good carrier for a number of reasons. So again, creating a dangerous situation um, with, a, with an invasive species. Um, right now, one of the things that my team is doing a lot of work on is the Queensland longhorn beetle. This is a wood boring beetle. Again, probably wasn't the, the beetle itself that came in, but probably in a baby form. So like larva that would be inside of a piece of wood. And this guy emerged and well, probably a girl emerged and she flew out and found some trees and started bur burrowing in and making new eggs and new babies. And this has been very devastating for our farmers. It affects trees, uh, our state tree, the kukui. It affects 
cacao trees, it affects breadfruit, ulu trees, again, one of the original trees brought by the first settlers as a food tree here being attacked by a, an invasive species. Um, so you see this poor, uh, our, in Puna, the poor homeowners that have the, these bugs are losing citrus trees, all kinds of stuff. And it's a pretty big beetle. Um, so it's a, little bit, it's a little bit intimidating to come across as well. It also hisses, so that's fun. Um, on the west side, they also have problems. Uh, this is impacting our ranching industry where this tiny bug, this is a really tiny insect, it actually uh, sucks all of the nutrients out of the grass. And this, it's called the two-line spittle bug. It jumps really far, lays lots of, of uh, babies everywhere in the soil. And unfortunately, it's already devastated 175,000 acres of pasture. So we've lost lots of ranch lands because of this little bug. Um, it's really scary because after the grass is gone, the things that come in are weeds. So things like pomacani, blackberry, the native species aren't coming back into those pastures at all. It's just more and more weeds. So we're getting more and more of the of the island covered with invasive plants because we're losing uh, and we're losing the economic value that we get from Hawaii grass fed beef, uh, which is a, a great economic driver for Hawaii. Um, one of the most devastating and in fact we had a contest this year for people to vote on what they thought the worst invasive species was and uh, this was the winner. If you call it, I don't know if that's a good thing to be the winner of this particular title, but in Puna in 2005, you have a beautiful, healthy forest, got a little bit of, of invasive plants in there, but it's still got a nice ohia canopy. It's got the nice hapu'u underneath. Um, same forest, just 10 years later. What happened? Rapid ohia death. This was a fungus, again, probably came in on a plant, um, just a regular house plant, and it's this fungus got into the forest and, and just happened to be able to enter into ohia trees and attack the vascular system of ohia trees. What rapid ohia death does is that it actually covers up the vascular system of the trees so the tree can't move water and nutrients up and down. So it basically sort of strangles the tree to death uh, where it can't get any food to its, uh, uh, or any water to its uh, leaves. So with, with that, you not only lose the ohia canopy itself, but you lose everything underneath. So uh, again, probably came in around the 1990s. Very, very devastating. We've already lost um, thousands and thousands and thousands of ohia trees to this disease. Very important problem, even in the modern times, even with the things that we've learned um, from our past mistakes. And in 2001, the Hawaii State Legislature actually said, all the government people said, the silent invasion of Hawaii by an alien invasive species is the single greatest threat to Hawaii's economy, natural environment, and the health and lifestyle of Hawaii's people and visitors. Um, so that's something to really think about. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of tools. Um, it's, it's a, it's a, <laughs> there's a lot of invasive species out there and not a whole lot of time and money. Uh, the best thing to do with invasive species is just never get them in the first place. Prevention, stop them at the border. Don't let them come in, you know, make, make a way that we, we don't let these things come in. If they do come in, you want to find them early, detect early. So we, you know, having people who are actively looking for stuff and looking where things are and saying, hey, is that, you know, what, what's that coming in and, and can we get to it very quickly? If we can get to it quickly, then we have a chance to eradicate it. If we find it early, we can maybe pull it out of there if it's a plant or, or control them all if it's a bug. Um, after that, after you sort of, that's a really short, narrow window. After that, you're, all you can do is either try to keep it in one place or keep it out of some place. We do have Hawaii Department of Agriculture, which uh, does a lot of that inspections at the border as things are coming in, but we get millions of tons of cargo every year and hundred ships coming into our ports a day, 800,000 flights, maybe not this year, but in most years. Um, in 2019, there were only 82 people in the entire state to actually be at those ports for all of those ships, all those millions of tons of cargo, all of those planes. There's only 82 people uh, to inspect 
all day long, all year long, even on holidays, everything that's coming in. Um, that's not a lot of, uh, of availability. Um, we do have a program right now called Mamalo Poi Poi, which is serum protection. And the idea here is we do that early detection where we actually have people go out to the airports and they look for certain species that we know are moving around the world, like Africanized honeybees, um, uh, red imported fire ants, things like that. Murder hornets, also one of the ones that we're looking for. Unfortunately, Mamalo Poi Poi is a short-term program and is actually scheduled to expire this year. So we could lose that program, even though the risk is actually increasing, not decreasing. This is the red imported fire ant, which is really fun because it can make a nice big raft on water, which our little fire ants can do as well. Um, things like the brown tree snake, which has devastated um, the birds in, in Guam. Africanized honeybees, very aggressive, can actually kill people and of course the murder hornets. So early detection, right? We're out there, we're looking for stuff. We also do early detection, not just with those insects, we're also doing early detection with plants um, because plants sneak in. Sometimes again, you're bringing in a potted plant and maybe there's some seeds in there from something else, you know? Um, somehow we still get plants showing up. Uh, people plant them because they don't know the difference. They think, oh, I, it, it was in a nursery. It should be fine. There's no law here against selling invasive plants. So people plant them in their backyard. And the next thing you know, it's spread into the forest behind the house. So um, we go out and we really search for these plants that are coming in. And we're, our goal is to try and get them here. Prevention Okay, it got in, fine, let's find it early and get rid of it. That's our goal, find it early and get rid of it. Sometimes it's already too late. Um, and at that point, it's sort of the landowner has to figure out how to take care of it. We've worked with some folks where we're trying to contain some species, but once it's really widespread, each individual landowner has to control it on their own. And as you can see, the longer that any invasive species, whether it's plant or animal, the longer it's here, uh, the more cost, the more money it costs to manage it. Um, right now, some of the things that we are eradicating, pampas grass is, um, as far as we know, we have searched for it quite a bit. We've taken out a lot in the last 10 years. It is now considered eradicated from the big island. Could it be introduced back again? Yeah, you can buy seeds on the internet for things. There's a, there's a danger that pampas grass could come back despite all the work that we did, did to get rid of it. Cotton Easter, we actually have, we're still working on that one. That was brought in probably in the 20s and 30s as a beautiful little bush to put in front of your house. And it has now spread into things that look like this, big giant thickets that are impossible to walk through. So we're trying to get rid of that one too. Um, once something's really, really widespread and we have no way to have enough people and money to go out and actually get it, things like Myconia, which is considered a very, very high risk plant around the world, not just in Hawaii. Um, then we look to biocontrol. So biological control is a scientific process. It's not just bringing something in and sort of throwing it out there. You really have to study the thing that you're bringing in for a lot of years to make sure that it's only going to attack the one that you want it to attack and that it's not going to attack other things and that it's not going to sort of evolve into something else. So in this case with Myconia, about 25 years of research, um, and testing on all of the native plants and all of the um, agricultural plants that we, we uh, have in Hawaii, looking at that and saying, great, this butterfly just goes after myconia. Um, and so it's a really, it's actually a cute little butterfly. If we can get that out there, what will happen is the butterfly will start to do what it does in its natural habitat, where myconia is from, this butterfly is also from. And back there, the butterfly, when it's a caterpillar in its caterpillar stage will actually eat holes in the myconia leaves. So it doesn't kill the myconia plant, but it does slow it down and make the leaves not as, as bushy. So it's helpful to the native forest because it's keeping the plant from spreading as fast. And it's also sort of letting light through so that some things underneath can continue to grow rather than myconia, usually that giant leaf shades out everything underneath. So things like that are the helpers that we try to bring in. But because it takes a lot of study and it's very time consuming and expensive up front, um, it, the, this only, only happens for a handful of things. It, it's, it's hard to get done for lots of things. 
Um, and if something is, is widespread but isn't quite into an area we're trying to protect, like in this case, fountain grass um, is widespread across the west side of the island, but we work with Hawaii Volcanoes National Park and the uh, State Department of Land and Natural Resources to try and keep fountain grass out of native uh, forest areas in South Kona. So this is some of the work that has to be done forever and ever. So you can see why the cost is, is higher once things have been here longer. So what are, we, what are we trying to do? So these days, Hawaii has a plan called the Interagency Biosecurity uh, Plan. Um, and that was released in 2017. And the goal of the plan, you can see there's a link down here that talks a lot more about it. The goal is really increase that biosecurity, increase the border so we're not letting so many things in, increase our ability to do early detection and eradication and, and really shore that all up and, and make sure everybody's communicating and working together um, so that we don't let things slip through the cracks. Um, unfortunately, it's not cheap to implement some of the recommendations in the plan and we need approval from the state legislature and we need uh, money to come from the state to actually put a lot of those things in. So this is something that uh, it would be nice to see it implemented by 2027, but it may be a challenge, especially with COVID to see it implemented by 2027. Um, the one thing that is most important when it comes to trying to prevent things from getting into Hawaii is looking at where are the highest risk things coming from? Like how are they getting here? And in 2015, the US Forest Service did a report that said, hey, we looked at all the pathways of how things are getting to Hawaii. And the number one, you know, look at number four here, plant materials. Plant materials, especially live plants, are by far the most important source of pest problems for Hawaii. So one of the things that we really believe in is not planting, not bringing in plants, like just um, really looking for local growers, right? Support, when, when they say buy local, support local business. Think about that, about that in the context of everything you're doing, including where, where did that palm tree come from? Was that palm tree grown in Florida or was that palm tree grown here in Hawaii? And those are important things. So what you can do is if your parents are going out to Home Depot to buy a plant, you tell them, ask, you know, hey, where did this come from? Because is this getting shipped in from, from the mainland? Maybe we don't want to keep bringing things in from the mainland where things are accidentally storing away. Um, and also, do we want to keep planting invasive plants? We go to nurseries and we see invasive plants like night blooming jasmine still being sold in nurseries. There's no law against it, but we know that stuff's in the forest and that it's taking over and it's preventing all the cakey koa trees from coming up. So really using tools like plantpono.org, encouraging your parents, encouraging everyone in your family um, to use that tool if they're gonna buy a plant. Look for a business that has committed, a local business that has said, we will not sell invasive plants. Um, and then maybe even ask that business, can you make sure that you're buying local grown plants as much as possible? Um, if you see anything weird, like a weird bug, report it. If it's, if it's just weird to you and we say, oh no, yeah, that's, that's okay, that's been here a while. Um, that's, we, I'd rather have 10 emails that I say, oh no, those, those are normal, that's okay, thanks for letting us know, than one person doesn't send us an email where they saw a weird bug and they thought, no, those science guys must already know about this. And then it's five years later and that bug has taken over everything. So report anything you see that you think is weird and maybe you'll just learn something from it. Um, writing testimony. A lot of times your social studies teacher might give you an opportunity um, to write a letter to your representatives. And I think it's so important that any time that you can use your voice about the things that are important to you, include invasive species in there and say, hey, I really want to see us protect our, our watersheds and protect our native species. So you can write a letter to your representatives um, asking for, for money and, and for help in making sure that Hawaii has everything it needs for biosecurity. Um, test your yard for little fire ants. Anywhere you are in Hawaii, across the entire state, you should be looking for little fire ants. Um, I just did this over this past weekend and I have, I have actually run a, a <laughs> little fire ant program for five years and I found little fire ants 
this weekend in my yard um, because my neighbors had it along their border. And so um, you have to go out there with the peanut butter sticks and you have to look or else nobody was getting stung. I had not gotten stung. My husband, my, my, uh, our tenant, nobody had gotten stung. I went and looked for the fire ants and they were there. So that's the important thing that people will say, oh, I never get stung. So it's fine. Uh, that is not, that doesn't mean you don't have fire ants. You don't start getting stung until you have a lot of fire ants. Um, and really just talk about invasive species and talk about that problem and, ma and making sure people know that there's a difference between an introduced species, which is just something that got here by, you know, human help and an invasive species, which is something that got here by human help, but also is causing harm uh, to something that we care about. Okay. Um, you can also, uh, if you're on social media, we have an Instagram and a Facebook page. We post stuff about invasive species, but we also post a lot of stuff about native species. Um, and this is, uh, April is native uh, plant month in Hawaii. So we've been posting a lot of stuff, beautiful pictures of native plants. But if you're on social media, uh, please go and follow us and like us. Um, we are also, we have a website at bis.org, which talks a lot more about our work. And you can always email me directly with questions at fbrewer at hawaii.edu. Um, thanks so much. Jade, is there any questions? Nope, no questions, you're all good. Okay, good. Then we can stop the recording. <laughs>